they've asked me today to kind of go through the medical requirements as far as you guys getting on to the job and then kind of what we do in a medical fashion here um, with the Edmonton Fire Service, right? So to start with, we'll go with these two courses. So these are your prerequisites, so what you will need to have to get onto the department. So you've got your International Trauma and Life Support, your ITLS, or your pre-hospital trauma life support, your PHTLS. Both of those courses are approximately 20 hours. You could do them on a weekend, okay? It's a hard course, okay? Um, and I'm only speaking from experience, right? And I'm certainly not trying to like push Nate or any of that stuff, right? But I'm just saying that's where I've worked. We're looking at about a 60% pass rate in that course. It's difficult especially when you do it in a weekend situation. I will admit, the first time I took that course, and I had eight years experience, um, I sat in the back of the room with my phone and had to Google a lot of stuff, right? Just to kind of give you an idea. Um, again, I'm not saying one way is better than the other, but I do like how Nate in the MFR program, which we'll talk about in a minute, injects the ITLS program into it so that they take this 20-hour, pretty in-depth, trauma-based course and inject it into an 80-hour course, which is spread throughout like a three-month period and allows you more time to read, to practice, to internalize, and hopefully will increase your, your level of success at that, right? So, just something to think about as you're kind of moving forward. That course, one of these two courses, and I don't recommend one or the other because they are pretty standard in what they do. Basically, this one was developed by emergency medical responders and the such EMTs, et cetera, et cetera, paramedics who work in an urban environment on the street, right? This was developed essentially for frontline trench work in the armed forces, okay? So that's just kind of where they came from. Um, and they've both morphed over time to become basically they, they offer the same the same product okay um, okay so they need to be valid within the last 18 months and that time frame is in regards to the you know, uh, March 1st 2018 registration time constraints okay so you have to also have one of these 80 hour courses so the courses have to be certified by Occupational Health and Safety and certified by our province, right? So, but they'll do that cross borders, right? Like if there's, a, if there's something that's offered in Ontario, the Alberta government will take a look at it and be like, yep, it's copacetic, it all matches, it's considered cross the board and that'll be good, but some of them are not, right? So it will be incumbent upon yourself to take a look at that and be like, oh, okay, I did take this course and unfortunately it's not up to snuff. Here's a good example. So EMR, EMT, EMTP or a paramedic here in Alberta and then you have those designations in Saskatchewan. Those quality management protocols, the rules set out by the government are off kilter in that if you're an EMT, a middle level in Saskatchewan, it's equal to an EMR, a bottle level here in Alberta. Basically the Alberta government requires more, okay, if that makes sense. So it'll be, you'll have to take a look at that, okay? And that's part of that too. So you have to have all this, but there's a caveat to it where you can bring a course, let's say you, you took a course in, in, in Texas, and they're like, I took all this course, and I've looked at it, and it looks like it's pretty copacetic. What do you think? You'll give it to us, we'll take a look at it and be like, Yep, okay, all the skills matches, all the knowledge base matches and everything. Yep, we'll accept that on a per use basis, okay? So you can, all, you can kind of take that with a grain of salt as well, right? But, okay, so Nate Medical First Responder or your MFR program or St. John's Ambulance, your Advanced First Aid or Red Cross Advanced First Aid, okay, or a current emergency medical responder EMR designation or an EMT designation or an EMP or a paramedic designation, right? With your Alberta College of Paramedics Association paperwork to match, okay? Um, now, if you are a current EMR, you've got all your coursework, 
and you've taken that, and that certificate is within the last time frame, right? You don't necessarily have to have your registration with the province, but again, that's kind of like on a per use basis, right? I mean, it's always, it's always better to have it than not have it, but we can always discuss that as far as that goes, right? And for those of us who don't understand how that works, if you took your EMR course, you've passed that course, let's say through this school, then the province has you come down and through the Alberta College of Paramedics, you basically write a second set of exams. You write their written exam and then you do your practical evaluation and then they say, yep, you're good, you took it from this school and I can confirm that your skill set is up to snuff. With the ITLS course, because it's a short course, if there's issues with your dates, you can bring in paperwork and say, I'm enrolled in this course, right? But with those other four courses that I talked about, your EMR, your MFR, your St. John's, you can't do that. The time frame is a lot bigger, okay? But there's none of that. You have to have it done before you apply. Those ones have to be finished, okay? And then this is just what I was talking about as far as like the QMPs, right? So if you're from a different province or somewhere else, you can bring in your paperwork and be like, does this apply? So, <clears throat> big question. A lot of guys always ask, okay, so what exactly is it that you do in the Edmonton Fire Service from a medical trauma base, okay? And this is where I will try to be as real with you as I can because I want you to make the best decision that you can for yourself, okay? So, we go on these types of calls. So through the dispatch service, they generate what's called like an alpha call volume. So alpha, bravo, charlie, delta, echo calls, just exactly what are those? Well, essentially an alpha and a bravo call, those are fluff calls. I stub my toe and I need to go to the hospital, but I can't drive myself because I don't drive, so the ambulance comes and picks them up and it's like, well, whatever, right? Okay, we don't, we don't go to those unless Every ambulance in the city is busy and they've got no option. We'll go and help, but we don't transport, so we'll stay there with them until an ambulance can come and pick them up. Right? So, I put in here compensating, so C. So something has happened to this lady here where her body needs to compensate to keep her alive. Right? Stroke, electricity, car accident, drowning, heart attack. Could be any of those things, right? Now she's compensating. She can only do that for so long. Now she's decompensating, meaning her body has no more energy to fulfill its needs, and now she's dying, essentially, is what we're looking at, right? She's, she's going into shock, and things are going downhill, or she has expired. So these are the calls we go to, okay? These are calls where it can get messy, it can get pretty busy, there's a lot of people involved. We, we see we see bodies, we see dead people, we see bad situations. We're involved in incidences that can get kind of messy, right? But we're there because we want to help. And I'd like to assume that everybody in the room, that's why you're here, right? That that's kind of part of your personality and you're there because you want to help, okay? Um, now there are certain considerations that I think you should take into account as you make your decision process, okay? So, first, people skills. So, you know what, I'm going to add this one too. So the Edmonton Fire Service has really good public relations, and that's because of our interaction with the public and our perception from them of how we do what we do for them at any given time. Now, I know we all want to be firefighters because we want to spray water on the fire and we want to do all that fun stuff and be on the news because you got some guy over your shoulder and you're coming out the window and all that fun stuff, right? But the reality of it is, is here in Edmonton, about 80%, give or take, of our call volume is based from trauma and medical. And that's where we spend a lot of our time. And the relationship that we have with the public doesn't come from them watching you spray water on the news. It comes from you and your son who just drowned in the bathtub and now I'm at your house and I'm having an interaction and it's personal and we're right here and you're watching how I behave. That's where that comes from, right? So you have to kind of think to yourself, you know, take a real self-evaluation and be like, where exactly are my people skills at? And if 
if you're not necessarily comfortable with that, you know, those types of calls, or if you think, yeah, I could definitely increase in my ability to do that, then I would highly encourage you to do that, right? Read a book, get a mentor, take a symposium, do something that would help elevate your ability to interact with people. Because you will be a representative, if you're fortunate enough to do that, of this patch and what it stands for. And there's a lot of expectations that come with that. Okay? So that's one part. Another consideration, and again, like I said, I want to be transparent, is, is your overall ability to do the work. So approximately 30% of frontline workers here in, here in Canada and in Alberta suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, I would venture to say that that's, those are the 30% who are, we'll say, brave enough to come forward and say, like, I'm, I'm experiencing something here and I don't know what to do with it, and we move through that process, right? So I would say, in reality, it's probably higher than that. Um, I know for a fact that there have been incidences in our department, in our city, within the last however many years, where unfortunately we have had firefighters take their own lives, right? And they suffered in silence for a long time because we didn't really know how to properly deal with the issue, right? And again, I'm, I'm not trying to deter you from, your, from what you're thinking, and I'm not trying to fear monger, I'm simply just trying to bring this to your attention so that you can make a good decision. Okay? Standing outside of a building and spraying water through a window, generally speaking, is not a stressful situation and doesn't produce that type of issue. It's these calls, okay? It's being on the side of the road while a mother is losing her stuff because her entire family was obliterated in a car accident, right? It's going to a call where someone was electrocuted in their backyard or my, you know, someone comes home to find that their grandfather is dead on the front street because he was shoveling snow and he wasn't supposed to be doing that, or all those different types of things, right? I mean, I've had the privilege of working in the department and also the non-privilege, if you want to call it that, to going to a lot of gross stuff, right? So what I'm saying to you is that just as you work your way through the program and as you think about do I want to do this for the rest of my life which I want to say first and foremost like working for the city is great working for this department is a one right is and if I had to pick a job to do for my life this would be it and I genuinely enjoy what I'm doing having said that I personally have experienced this and have gone through you know, a lot of the healing process to try and fix that. So I feel I can speak from experience. And you know what, I'm going to let you know, this is what happened to me. Okay? In order to protect myself emotionally, I started to treat people like goldfish. Essentially, well, there goes, he's dead, flush him. Right? In order to protect myself. I didn't realize that that's what I was doing. That started to roll into my interactions with everybody else. That's, that's the way that I interacted with everybody. And it wasn't until like my wife and I had to have like a real conversation about something needed to happen. Because at that point, I just went home and like self-medicated with my Xbox, to be honest, for like five hours a day in the evening because I just didn't know how to deal with anything and I was so bottled up, right? So there are new programs in place. I was able to go and speak with a therapist. I was able to work through some of the issues. I didn't know why I was feeling what I was feeling, but I was able to kind of go through that and it helped immensely. Later on, even my, my oldest daughter who was having issues at school, you know, we were able to get her help through the program, which didn't come at an expense to us, which is something that was really great. In order, I mean, we're, we're dealing with like bullying issues and things at school, but the program is enveloping like your whole family and your whole system. So one of the programs that we have is peer-based peer driven uh, incident management relief. Yeah, so let's say you went to a really bad call. Um, the captains now are trained to kind of notice certain things as well as the guys are informed that they can ask for this. They kind of shut down the hall for a portion of time 
your peers will come in and kind of help do like a debrief and a, a post-incident review to kind of get things all roaming around. And it's not even necessarily that it's anything crazy, right? Like I, one particular thing was like these gentlemen went to a call and that little boy that they were working on was wearing the same clothes that one of the gentlemen sent his kids to school in that day, right? And it just, he didn't snap, but it definitely was like, okay, this all of a sudden became very real to me, right? And they were able to deal with that. So, and it's really good. So but my point is, is just work on your people skills, have a real evaluation as to whether or not this is something that you're really looking forward to doing and that you think you really can do, and just be completely aware that there are issues that you can deal with, right? So, a little bit of an explanation as far as what we do um, when you guys come down to the school. So, in the training program, there's about 14 days, give or take, that are medical based. So, the first chunk we take and it's lecture based and you go through material and we prep you to write your exams, right? Then we do lab based scenario type stuff where you get to hands on materials and get to know your equipment. Then we work in the classroom in a scenario situation where you can work with your peers and kind of hammer out some kinks. Then, um, in the past, things that we've done. So then we take you as a group, we take you to a daycare facility. And you spend the day just interacting with children, working on your people skills, not necessarily doing like medical based stuff, but just playing with them and interacting with them because that's a particular group that a lot of people, especially if you don't have kids or if you're younger in life, find to be quite stressful and difficult interacting with. So we try to prep you that way. Then we take you to a couple different high schools where the drama students put on like trauma-based scenarios for the day or two. So we try to have, you know, like a lot of acting and a lot of fun stuff and, and try to make it as real as we can. Then from there we'll go to like an old folks facility where the senior citizens, it's, it's like I can ask, oh Grandma Gina, have you ever gone to the hospital? Yeah, with what? With this. Do you think you could act that out? Sure, I can act that out. And so we try and give the recruits real time, real life, real patient, hands-on experience for a period of time, right? A couple of days. And then hopefully what we'll do after that is take you, we'll take you to Poundmaker and we'll integrate what we're doing into hopefully the training program from like Alberta Health Services or what have you, where they'll bring in their recruits, let's say like, you know, medics. We'll do like a car extrication where we pull it all apart and we do the trauma-based medical stuff and then we're working with the paramedics as we try to integrate our skills and learn about how everybody works and how everything all gets put together. So that hopefully by the time you hit the floor, you feel confident in your skills and then we take you and we run you through like a mentorship program on the floor where your first 10, 20 calls, you're not in charge, you're helping and we slowly kind of release the reins on you until you're ready to go and then off you go and, and away you go, right? So, this is just kind of an ex, you know, this is some of the equipment that we use just to kind of go through a couple things that we do, right? So like down on the end there's some training dummies and things like that. Over here we've got like our AED, right? Our automated external defibrillator for cardiac issues, right? Here's an example of like a tourniquet that we would use in training. This is a, a product called the Mega Mover, okay? So we use it when we're moving large people. There's, this is a seat version. We also use like a tarp that has a bunch of handles on it that holds a thousand pounds. This kit is the airway kit. So we've got like suction, bag valve masks, different types of products that we use to help maintain the airway, okay? This is the trauma kit. So different types of um, bandages, trauma dressings, uh, splinting materials, all that kind of stuff that we would use to try and assist patients that way. Then over here we have the combi kit. So this is a backpack version of the best portions of these two kits so that I can put this on my back and go in the trench or get out on the ice or do a number of different things, right? Down the embankment and all that fun stuff, right? So that's kind of an example of the, the equipment that you would use, um, different types of calls that we would go to, um, and that kind of stuff.